Good morning. Hello again. Dan Winter here. This is the fourth in this video series uh, on the galactic history, uh, the master reference uh, site for all the resources, films, and links for this series is fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. The, the title of this lecture is the physics of God and the ET origins of Earth's religions. <laughs> Hopefully this is going to be colorful and fun. I want to uh, apologize to those who have asked me to go slower. <laughs> and uh, we try to respect that. And at the same time, you know, we can't do a brief history of time and, and uh, compress it well. So let's compromise here and see if we can't make this colorful for everyone. So a uh, reminder here. Uh, <clears throat> this is the fourth lecture in a series. So the first one uh, was uh, the Physics and Science of Ascension. That's the first video in this series, all in our uh, YouTube channel, uh, Fractal Field. And uh, very briefly, in summary, when the phonon harmonics of heart and brainwave and sacrocranial coherence uh, entrain and braid implode the DNA, the projective geometry plasma projection of implosion of the DNA called fusion in the blood is the physics of bliss process enabling the projection of transverse to launch tubal coherence the ba from the ka and so the aura gets spin dense in plasma projective and that's what enables that longitudinal EMF coherence to enable lucid dreaming and taking memory through death and all the good stuff getting a soul as it were so that was the physics of ascension because the number of harmonics ascend by golden ratio when the spin density braid implosion enables that compression to be implosive, negentropic and centripetal. So the physics of ascension is literally bliss in DNA, and it fits the physics of superposed axis of symmetry, which is how you go to the next dimension. So that was the physics of ascension video. And these, this film series has been... Uh, I would say went viral, and I'm grateful for all the interest. So the second in the uh, film series, which was uh, the extraterrestrial value of humans, um, it was a context-setting science to begin the extraterrestrial galactic history series. And in that uh, film, we just emphasized three basic scientific underlying principles to enable understanding galactic history. One was the, the physics of how... Uh, uh, pyramids work, uh, uh, charge implosion, uh, enabling the pyramid to piezoelectrically, the Hummer, uh, implode the capacitance of the Earth and thus become a zero-point energy device. And that was distributed because those pyramids are all at the dodeca Ecosa fractal longitudinal nodes, which is the only physics of power at a distance, something Tesla did not finish. And that longitudinal interferometry then becomes the physics of an Earth energy grid, which is wireless and is in fact uh, the beginning also of the collective unconscious, but deeply uh, related to the physics of gravity maintenance. So this longitudinal array symmetry is a profound subject. The other two main subjects of that the second film were uh, longitudinal interferometry in general, and then finally uh, the physics of how stargates and portals work. If you take the known physics of plasma implosion, therify.net, proven to be a lucid dreaming trigger because of the longitudinal projection, um, and you extend that to more uh, broad spectral pine cones kiss noses implosion and you match the send point to the receive point accurately you can actually translate not just the inertia of your aura but eventually the physical material as well if you match send point to receive points very accurately and so we actually understand quite a bit about the physics of stargates and portals uh, not just Jody Foster's dodeca but also uh, Andrew Basiago's detailed descriptions of the um, chroma visor and the other uh, portals, stargates, he describes fairly well there at Gaia.com, etc. So that was the second in the video series. The third in the video series, uh, this is the thumbnail review now, remember, uh, was Introduction to Galactic History. And that was a very big context setting, and it begins basically with the uh, humanoid diaspora in the Orion Wars of Expansion, where uh, millions of humanoids died in the attack on Lyra and Vega by the Draco a reptilian Kingu. And the humanoid diaspora then extends 
to tens of thousands of now uh, prominent humanoid species in this galactic sector is reported by multiple sources, including in Pleiadians, and that diaspora includes Pleiades and Sirius and many other uh, humanoid cultures. And uh, then in that context, which is kind of a Pleiadian story, remember referred to Med at Mediator Medias, um, that uh, we can then embed the story from Anton Parks, the detail of the history of the uh, Anunnaki, um, uh, which becomes uh, a what is clearly, since we will talk here, that Anki what looked like a frog, <laughs> green, all of, and he's Osiris essentially, and every picture of Osiris in Egypt is green for that reason. Uh, maybe we actually uh, look at that picture here. We. So if you ever wondered why, uh, let's see here, or Tim, yeah. So here's. Uh, Anton Park's picture of Enki. Uh, you know, he looks like a frog, a reptilian, you know, these. And um, is there any other answer to the question of why every single picture of the face of Osiris in Egypt is green? <laughs> so that begins to give you the answer. So when, when Enki wakes up in his father's cloning cooking pot in, uh, in Pleiades, uh, <clears throat> and uh, begins his, essentially, the war with the traditional sort of Draco reptilian values of his father, Anu, who's at war with what we now know as a female-dominated culture, and the Pleiadians from uh, Sirius, from Tegata, Pleiadians, uh, Swaru, uh, uh, Cosmic Agency, they make no secret of the fact that they are a female-dominated culture. And so they're escaping from that female-dominated culture, the reason every single Earth religion begins with uh, fear of women. And they run here, among other places, to Earth and are in hiding from being chased by a female dominant culture. Not just now we know the Pleiadian, but also the Federation of Planets. So the end of that film takes us to uh, the Federation of Planets and the Pleiadians and Andromeda's others uh, send a, a major war fleet uh, to the solar system to take out the Draco here. And the resultant battle in those Orion Wars in the solar system took out Tiamat and the huge flood uh, from the water there uh, comes on Earth. And that's the context from which the then Andromedan installed artificial metal hollow moon becomes the nuclear frequency radiator called the frequency fence mechanism of the quarantine, which was a primitive early attempt by the Galactic Federation to quarantine and contain the interventionist um, uh, Draco Uru reptilian uh, here on this planet. Uh, now we know that the end of that story was the those nuclear generators on the moon are decaying and that allows the Earth's harmonic series, an extension of the implosive Schumann harmonics, why Gaia is negentropic, uh, to now become more implosive, retuning 53 to 50 hertz, more perfect phase conjugate implosion. Christians call this the rapture when the Earth's solar system aura becomes more implosive, the, the alignment with galactic uh, quadrant, etc., enabling phase conjugation. And so that is why guns will melt during the rapture, because anything metal, of course, has the wrong dielectric and will generate heat, the same reason that the metal amplifier and therify generates heat if it gets too close to the plasma tubes. Um, and so it, that means, uh, as the, this quote-unquote rapture, which is simply plasma density, sometimes called ascension, approaches, more humans will experience lucid dreaming. And that gets us to the physics of this longitudinal interferometry. And that was the end of video number three, bringing us to this video, video number four in this series. And uh, the subtitle, uh, uh, the title of this video is The Physics of God. How did the concept of the divine or God or uh, uh, God's presence come to be uh, such a big part of the origin of Earth's religion. What's the physics of that? And the second is, what is then the summary of the extraterrestrial context for the origins of all religions on this planet? So that's the subject of this film, video number video number four in this series. <clears throat> so, now actually we have an outline 
uh, which is in front of you here. And um, uh, so I, you know, I'm going to actually have some structure here, we hope. Uh, uh, and remember, all of these resources, this outline, all these links are at the master link for this series, which you see down here below my name, fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. So now, <laughs> first you tell them you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them you told Oh, yes. <laughs> now, we start. So, the physics of God. The urge to know God effectively is to know uh, how plasma domains, which we now know they're all toroidal, vortex-based, pine cones kissing those. And when toroidal plasma domains, like our sun, for example, or ball lightning, when they become implosive, they become negentropic, self-organizing, able to self-refer, non-destructive compression, enabling the origin of biologic negentropy, the title of my book. And that creates self-awareness, the ability to self-reenter. And so that knowing of that principle uh, means that we have an urge to embed in this divine, and it starts at a very small level and ends at a very galactic level. For example, the word Yahweh, yod heh vah -Heh, we'll see, is a name for two light cones that converge, the original plasma star map of Orion at work. So the Yahweh is the one who can inhabit the big vortex. <laughs> so essentially, the, the urge to be God or to know God is the urge to embed and become a bigger and bigger vortex, which is appropriate. That's what evolution is. So the physics of God is actually the physics of embedding in bigger and bigger tornadoes. And that does not belittle in any way the beauty of the spirituality of religion because inherent in those big vortex is the mind of God. It's true that, you know, the plasma field of the collective domain around this planet called the collective unconscious communion of saints or song lines is self-organized and self-aware and it is a survival library of memory information and it is potentially loving in the sense that it, 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 it knows who has pure intention, you see? So the, the, the idea of self-awareness inhabiting a universe is good. And, and it is beautiful, and it is divine, and it's spiritual, and it is a beautiful physics, which is ultimately the opposite of the childishness of miracle worship and personality worship, which we need to grow out of quickly if we want to escape these religion wars and wake up from the nightmare that was history. <laughs> okay, the second subtitle of this uh, series is the ET origins of Earth's religions, and that's where we're going now. So remember, the physics of a solar being, the sun is the best example of plasma intelligence locally, and every uh, solar shaman and clairvoyant, uh, whoever, like uh, Ledby and Bassant, Psych Perception of Quarks and Occult Chemistry, Theosophy, everyone who every clairvoyantly focused on the sun, they saw this Anu shape, seven spins inside, five spins outside, the perfect slip knot, which they also saw identically when they looked clairvoyantly, not at the heart of the sun, but the heart of the human, the outer seven layers of muscle. We have lots of pictures we'll together. So the heart of the human is the same slip knot, seven spins outside, seven layers of this axis of spin of the tetra is the seven layers of heart muscle, literally, in the Pettigrew dissections, etc. So there's sevenarrows.net. We have all those pictures. And then when, when they finally looked at the heart of hydrogen, <laughs> why, they saw the same thing. <laughs> and they, each time they called it the Anu. <laughs> so, and An came to mean sun god. Uh, and we're, we're coming there because every single religion on this planet is effectively a sun god religion. Certainly the Christian religion, every historian who's ever studied Christian religion. Well, there's a hundred religions in a row and they all ended up to be sun god religions and Christian was just the end of that cascade of dominoes, but they were all worshiping the sun. The same thing as Osiris, uh, Atun, uh, solar religion, the idea of one god. So, so the doorway of self-awareness that comes radiating through the plasma spin density of the sun is why we worship sun gods, because basically, if you don't grow up to inhabit a star with a centripetal vortex of your plasma, you do not graduate from kindergarten. This is not escapist. No, no, this is called growing up. So every Christian, uh, oh yes, and so the next theme in our outline is why stars need human evolution. In other words, what is the symbiotic relationship why stars wanted humans of DNA in the neighborhood so badly? <laughs> You know, it's a lot of work for these. The sun says, oh, the incubator there is getting uh, 
overdue for birth here and, and we're not getting fruit from the and wh wh what the sun means by that is we create a centripetal force potentially first you know draco thinks we're useless because we can't make this vice-like grip of plasma that holds first your head together and then a star together so if you can't make an implosive plasma tornado become centripetal oops gotta click my gadget here losing power um, if you can't make an implosive uh, centripetal force, you haven't grown up, and the Draco thinks you, you're just edible like chickens until you grow up, you know? Well, anyway, there's a certain metabolic relationship with the wolf of, and what they eat. So when we grow up, when we get centripetal, that's the, the story of this mori, that's where we're going with it all the time. And specifically, ultimately, we create the centripetal force which makes star evolution sustainable. And I mean specifically, remember, 11 different times it was measured that when more than a million children sang the same song at the same time together, the number of solar flares decreased dramatically. Why? <laughs> Those children, there were, mil there were a million children singing the same song, created a centripetal force that inhabited our star, and that's been measured 11 times. <laughs> it, it, it's called peacemaking, centripetal force. So stars need what we can make specifically if we grow up and become stars. So this is a good introduction to why you want to go to Hollywood. I mean, why? <laughs> you want to become a star? Okay. So this is kind of now going to be a retelling of the myth of the birth of the hero, Otto Rahn, and the flight of the wild gander through the ages, uh, Joseph Campbell. We're taking Joseph Campbell and updating him with physics, the physics of the myth and the, the more historical understanding of our extraterrestrial history. Um, and, and, and examples here. So who was Noah? Uh, we, we have this quote right here in our, um, in our outline here. Oh, yes, down here. Zeusudra was one of several mythic characters who are the pro protagonists of the Near Eastern flood myth. Remember, most every culture has a giant flood myth, and Zeusudra is basically Noah. Now, <laughs> the, the reason I want to tell you the story is Noah is the hero specifically because he can lucid dream. Now remember, the Anunnaki Nephilim, uh, Inky's family basically, are here on Earth and they say, oh, this big asteroid is coming and the gravity wind is going to make this huge fl flood. And basically, and Lil, <laughs> uh, Amun versus Atun, and Lil and his Draco family tells Enki, now don't you tell those humans that there's a big flood coming because there's too many of them. We need to kind of get rid of them. They make too much noise copulating at night, so we really got to, I mean, this is the actual story in Sumeria. And, and so he makes Enki promise that he's not going to tell Noah, Ziasudra, that there's a big flood coming. But then Enki says, uh, I will, the story in Sumeria is, I will see as if behind a screen of transparency, which means I will go to Noah in a lucid dream. And if he can lucid dream coherently, then he can get the message. And that's the proof that he, Noah, is worth saving. In other words, the lucid dreamer is the hero. And that's the story to this whole mori we're doing today, is the lucid dream, or is the myth of the birth of the hero. So the, the skill to be able to lucid dream. Now, the other part of this story is, um, is uh, uh, Credo Mutwa's story. Uh, I, I wanted to just do it. You know, we want to thank our uh, one, many global sponsors, Roland in South Africa, our uh, biodynamics center, where we did that series of lectures for introducing us to Credo Mutua, and we went over there uh, not long after uh, David Icke, and uh, did documentary with Credo Mutua. And of course, Credo's amazing, you know, the, the Zulu, they know exactly who Enki was, because Kiliman, Kilimanjaro is named after Enki, and they even know which greys they would eat part of their bodies, and they would have psychedelic experiences. The same reason why uh, mummy powder was served in every pharmacy in Europe for 300 years because there was a high concentration of gold powder, which wasn't because the ancient Egyptians were eating the gold. No, because the physics of the alchemy of the natron salt in mummification transmuted human flesh into a gold powder amulet. That's why mummy powder was served in every pharmacy in Europe for 300 years. 
Anyway, Credo Mutua of the, the Zulu, like all the Zulu, they knew very well why a little bit of the body of the greys induce psychedelic experiences. This was related to the, uh, the collectivizing dialectic of the uh, actual flesh, which is the mummy powder, uh, was, was psychoactive. Anyway, uh, so they, they have very good knowledge of the extraterrestrials among the Zulu, and we're going to talk about gold powder later in there again. But the point I want to make here was, among other things, Credo Mukwa emphasizing that on the day that the police and military forcibly held down his granddaughter and forcibly vaccinated her, that was the day she stopped lucid dreaming. Think about that. Now, I'm not saying that every vaccination will prevent lucid dreaming. I, I'm not a medical person. What I am saying is now we know, now that we know of the physics, the only way we graduate is get that kind of coherence in our aura, meaning the only actual way to test a vaccine is to find out if it affects lucid dreaming. <laughs> is one, that's one important factor. Now, the more generalized medical principle here is once you understand that you have an aura, Oh, the medical profession doesn't know yet. Please tell them, would you? <laughs> Once you know that you have an aura, and it's the only way you lose a dream and get an immune system and take memory through death, so it's the purpose for living, then you can actually dis define what healing is and medicine and what the medical profession is for, and then you can even define what architecture is for. Once you know that getting a coherent aura is the only way to graduate. So you can measure that before and after GDB in other ways, whether the vaccine or any medical practice grows your aura, the same way you decide which broccoli to eat based on whether your aura gets bigger or smaller. And in fact, it's a simple physics result of our understanding of physics consciousness is Every decision in life is about simply, did it make your aura bigger? And by the way, that's not subjective, GDV, it's measurable. So, hello, we could actually define which vaccines allow you to have a soul and which vaccines destroy your immortal soul. Now that we know what that is, and that's the thread wormhole that goes into longitudinal EMF coherence propagation, the bar from the cat, etc. And we got some clues from that, from beautiful Credo Mutwa. So this was an example of the myth of the birth of the hero is the one who lucid dream. His granddaughter who got the beautiful indigenous DNA. And remember where we're going with this when we see later that the Draco, Draco Greys at being paid, the Greys Kumer being paid by the Draco when they did all the abductions after the Griotta Treaty uh, uh, they 90% indigenous blood. The reason was because they were the lucid dreamers. And that's the DNA that the Draco, the Greys, needed. <laughs> because the lucid dreamers is what they didn't have in their aura. All of Humpty's Dumpty's they couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. Humpty Dumpty's egg is the physics of make what makes an ensouled child. That's the metaphor. So the next little story that fits this picture was Luke Skywalker, remember the Jedi is the plasma projector, the raising of the Jed is the Jedi sword. Jed principle is the physics of plasma projection in essence. In fact, that's why, well, I got this really pretty little picture out here. We just got to have it here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the reason Therify.net logo is the plasma projector. That's a therified plasma. I mean, oh, no, no, that's a light bulb. I mean, no, that's ancient Egypt. <laughs> no, that's a device I will raise a Shem unto the Lord to make the plasma field that makes you immortal. This was an anti-aging device, and the Sumerians talk about it if extensively in their literature, that when they arrived on Earth, the reason they started to age catastrophically was our plasma environment was not phase conjugate implosive enough. The physics of what Swaru and Pleiadians say when they insult humans on every other page saying, you're 3D and we're 5D. What they mean by that is the plasma is not implosive enough to be coherently longitudinally projected. And that's the reason the Anunnaki Draco aged catastrophically when they arrived here, which is all over the Sumerian literature. And this was part of the technology, what they meant by, I will raise a Shem unto the Lord. I will raise a charge imploder, stone circle pyramid, phase conjugate device, to enable the implosion that prevents aging, literally the immortality technology. So, <clears throat> 
Luke Skywalker, the Jedi, <laughs> wakes up in his cloning cooking pot, uh, please, to find, to find out that Dad, <laughs> Darth Vader, is half machine. Oh, my. And then Muab Deeb and Dune wakes up to find Dad, our Conan, is half machine. Oh, my. And then Enki, as an end on Parks, wakes up in the cloning cooking pot in the Pleiades to find out Dad, a new half track, is half machine. Oh, my. What is the coincidence here? So, so the coincidence here is uh, Dad was half machine. This gets us back to our the, the scourge of artificial intelligence, which is the scourge of the galactic sector uh, elsewhere. And it, until we know the difference between being half machine and what it is to have a soul, so until we can teach the physics community, who can then teach governments what it is to lose your soul, we won't be able to make any of the important decisions. Oh my. That's why we are here right now telling the story to you right now, because uh, we need to get that straight, or else we are going to be half machine. <laughs> okay, so Luke Skywalker, the other part of the story is, um, they worship uh, an ancestor called, and here it is, Shailud, Shaihulud, uh, which is the sandworm becoming self-aware. Now remember, the sandworm is planted like seeds, when the, when the gold powder grows up and becomes the earth energy lines, the dragon current, which are a sandworm. And deep in the magnetic memory of those earth energy lines, a sandworm, the dragon current, is the government of the universe, Shai Hulud, the, the voice of the stars, the voice of ancestors. And they worship this appropriately as the aboriginals do under the name Dreaming Line or Song Track. Now, understanding why those same magnetic lines that are the physics of telepathy and how to get through death and lucid dream and plasma check, and that those energy line crosses, you get these uh, cozy rev mirrors, make telepathy, and at the energy line crosses, you get measurably reduced radioactive critical mass, as Bruce Cathy measured. So why are these energy line, magnetic lines, the voice of ancestors? Why is it shy lube? Let's meditate on that. Okay. So that was the intro to the intro of the intro, <laughs> frankly speaking. <laughs> now, we want to uh, see if we can uh, take the big galactic history from the last film, Orion Wars, and bring it into the local uh, Earth history uh, to get a better sense, for example, of the extraterrestrial origin of Earth's religion. We know why there is an urge to have a god, as it were. So the, the, the Draco Kingu emerged, they literally ran from the Palladian United Federation of Planets uh, during and after the Orion Tiamat Wars into the Earth quarantine. Now, um, remember when, when uh, Swaru and the Palladians is insisting, uh, you know, Lemuria was the good guys because that was us Palladians, and Atlantis them was the bad guys because that was them, they're reptilians. Well, remember, Atlantis is named Thule after Tehuti, Thoth, uh, who uh, also is the name for basically Greenland Thule, and uh, for the, the name of the royal family lineage of the Egyptian, Thuthmosis, which transliterated means the sons of Thoth. And, and even though Vincent says Thoth was only missed, no, no, no. Thoth, uh, uh, Ningashida, was a very real Sumerian character. He was the science officer, partner of Enki, and he knew what life force was, called the Caduceus, which we now know as phase conjugation. So anyway, um, now that family is stuck on Earth. The quarantine is part of it. But remember, they were such, such klutzes that the Anunnaki Draco could only get through the Van Allen belts navigationally by nuking their way through. And that's why they needed the Ark of the Covenant, which was an Assyrian-made implosive capacitance, which we now know will reduce radioactivity, and that was their container for their nukes. <laughs> and it was a war chest, yes, and there was a mercy seat, implosive vest. But originally, its main function was non-destructively containing the nuclear tech devices of the Draco. So uh, they were stuck on Earth. The Stargains ain't working, and their their nukes are gone, and uh, they can't, you know, it's well reported. They're stuck here. So compare this with 
the genesis of the Grail Kings, Lawrence Garvin, who's very convinced that the dragon line the Dracos are the good guys, just like the shining ones. Well, whether they're good guys or bad guys, let's get the history sorted out. And so, um, the, in Genesis of the Grail Kings, the physics of the Grail blood, remember, Grail in the blood is the name for the charge implosion fractally in DC, in, in DNA, that happens in the presence of bliss, you know, our Grail animations. It's very, very clear what the Holy Grail is. It is the implosive cup of, of braided fractality in blood that is the... <laughs> That is the Lord of the Ring. It's, your DNA becomes to royal. And that is the Grail in the blood. And that is the voice of ancestors. We know the Holy Grail is very accurately. And the physics is beautiful. So in Genesis, the Grail Kings, we're, they're trying to sort the origins and the loss of psychokinesis in implosive DNA through genetic lines. Now, there's a context to this because that we're going to be discussing this. The dra the drac. The Draco culture, we're going to discuss the blood chemistry here, um, uh, in their home star, uh, um, Alpha Draconis and Orion, uh, the uh, ambient radioactivity is higher. And so now that the Draco Uru have a predominantly lipid oil-based blood, and all this is in the Chemistry of Alien Blood article by Bill Donovan, to get our reference here, fractalfield.com slash fusion of the blood. So some, something about the blood chemistry of the Draco Uru Anunnaki Nephilim is necessary to understand. They, uh, their lipid oil-based blood, remember, McDonald's French fry is a perfect dinner for a drag. You, know, you got oil, and then you got the Pepsi Cola, and they got the phosphorus blade-based uh, electron transport. So everything's perfect at McDonald's for a Draco. And remember, you can tell when the Draco are winning the war on any star because, on any planet, because if the Draco are winning, the oxygen goes down, it's a poison to them, and the radioactivity goes up. So guess who's winning on this planet? Well, is, is that an indicator? I think it is. Uh, and also, we're going to get to it later, but they, they, they had a more carbon-based bone structure and a more silicon-based nerve structure meant higher propagation nervous velocity in the nerve conduction in the Draco, which meant higher frequency EEG, uh, more gamma at 44, and actually we now know that uh, the not just Tibetan gamma 40 hertz, uh, which triggers uh, uh, children's ability to see without their eyes when we get there, but uh, 200 hertz, very high gamma, Triggers the snap moment has been measured. Rodrigo Montenegro measured 200 hertz gamma, and that's the click when you can project yourself out of your body. <laughs> so, yes, the Draco had more telepathy because they had higher frequency brainwaves because they had higher phase propagation velocity in the nervous tissue, silicon based, more telepathy, but less low frequency alpha, theta, delta, and therefore less ability to embed longer waves, therefore less empathy and compassion, which is almost unknown actually in the Draco culture, we believe. So we're going to get more, talk more about the Draco blood chemistry in a moment, but the, so the Draco, as many have said, they were breeding the royal family lines of Europe. Remember, it was all one bloodline. Catherine of Russia is related to uh, Elizabeth of U Victoria of UK is related to the King of Germany. They're all one family. That's, that's clear history. In fact, World War I only started up when that family broke. <laughs> but the point was that the Draco created royal bloodlines for a very specific purpose. Originally, they were to be babysitters, which was their only function was to interpret God. <laughs> and now we know who God is. God is Draco. Why did they want to be called God? Well, because <laughs> they were the chief babysitters locally. So locally, the concept of who is God was basically the local drac parasite. And this is not good. But there's a bigger context which actually makes it a little bit more romantic, which we will get to. But locally, the royal lines were very specifically created for a very specific purpose. And, it, and I think Lawrence Gardner in Genesis of the Grail Kings got most of that story right. He was a good historian. Genetic babysitter for Drac, quote-unquote, uh, God the function of royal lines. Now, but the deep inside that was royalty meant purple radiance, which meant 
an aura that was becoming divine, that was an aura that can become star inhabiting. So there is a stellar purpose to becoming, you know, the agent of God on a planet, which is once your aura becomes centripetal enough, yes, you can steer the star, and Osiris was real. <laughs> okay, now, the localization of that story next takes us to this book, Out of Egypt and House of the Messiah, Ahmed Osman, later taken up by Lawrence Gardner, a good historian, saying that basically most of the Christian story and bloodline came, quote, out of Egypt. And what he means by that is Akhenaten either is or is basically Moses, and as in the righteous priests of the Essene. And, you know, the, the story is that uh, Akhenaten, Atun, he was trying to uh, support Enki's side of the family, Atun. Uh, however, the Amun-Ra priests, who are the bankers, uh, control the checkbook, and Akhenaten was not very good with checkbooks. And so he changed his name and ran for his life and changed his name to Moses and became a gold powder cook. That's the short version of that story, which is the origin of the Essenes. And the Essenes cottage industry was selling gold powder to all the royal families. They, this is pretty well established historically. Well, in the little bigger picture of this, uh, you have the book God King Akhenaten, or Royal King or Extraterrestrial King Akhenaten by Daniel Stewart, saying, among other things, that uh, Tutankhamun slash Akhenaten is basically the climax of a many generations long genetic experiment involving the Syrians and we believe the planetary federal. But they did long term genetic experiments. Remember, Bleeding, breeding like we were show dogs. And so the Tutankhamun incarnation, which is why I'm grateful that I had that fragment of the soul memory of the Tutankhamun when I fainted in the gold sarcophagus at the Tutankhamun Museum in Cairo after I woke up in the sarcophagus of the Great Pyramid and the lights went out. I had some experience there. And I don't call it past life memories. I call it fragments of soul memories. But so the Tutankhamun was a climax of a genetic experiment, clearly. You know, the conehead skull, the doliocephalic, which is the kundalini trigger, and the horns of Moses, meaning kundalini ventricle liquid horns cohering, as in Lucifer, light eye the fire. And when the experiment, Thoth Moses, sons of Thoth, sons of Tehuti, the name for the royal line of Egypt, when that experiment failed to produce the leadership of a real spiritual tradition, that experiment was plowed under, as it were, and emerges as Christianity with the same blood that Tutankhamun, according to these historians, is the biggest part of the Jesus story. Now, there's multiple characters that became in, embedded in this Jesus story. Part of them was his character in, in Jerusalem. But the other part of the myth was the Tutankhamun Akhenaten story, who becomes Tutankhamun, the righteous priest, becomes Moses, who becomes the beginning of the Essenes, called Out of Egypt. And so we're getting a sense now you have Syrian involvement, you have Pleiadian involvement, and you have Draco involvement in Earth religion. We're getting some context. Okay, next piece of the story. Um, Stuart Swerdlow, we, you know, we knew many of the Montauk uh, survivors. I worked with Preston Nichols for years, uh, and uh, uh, Duncan uh, was friends with Roger, etc. And then uh, I lived and hang, hung out with Al Bielik for years, and my friends um, were the uh, ones who uh, processed the hypnosis of the Montauk survivors, uh, Ken Page and multi cellular healing. The way that all started after Grimville was uh, when they took the Montauk survivors and did the hypnosis to, to unpack their memories. And so we knew, uh, you know, Ken Page did a conference at my farm, and so, Sewer Swerlow was one of the Montauk survivors, and he drew this map uh, related to the uh, overpowering influence of this Draco named Charlie, who apparently ran the Montauk project from the Draco side. And um, he drew this chart of which ETs were responsible for which religions and cultures on planet Earth. And notice there's some agreement here that the uh, Syrian uh, uh, became uh, Hebrew. Um, and uh, the uh, the Draco uh, were behind the Lyran, and notice the Vega 
and the lyrae became the humanoid diaspora, which we're talking about here. So you see that the, the, the preview of what we later learn from the Pleiadians actually in part fits uh, uh, Stuart Swerdlow's post Montauk drawing of which extraterrestrial cultures were pulling the strings behind which earth uh, uh, culture and which earth religion. And this will, will then move up into the present uh, when we get more of the current Pleiadian Andromedan information. By the way, that picture will be, of course, in the uh, resources for this series at fractalfield.com slash fusion of blood. But also that original article is called goldenmean.info slash invasion, in which we discuss more about that Montauk story. So, <clears throat> when the Egyptian Thuthmosis, and remember Thuthmosis, Thoth, Tehuti, uh, 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 Hermes, uh, was also called the line of DWD, Tuhudi, in or it was TWT, was the abbreviation for the word Tuhudi, TWT, which later was written DWD, which is the line of David. So when the Hebrews say we come from the line of David, what they actually mean is we're the bloodline of Tuhudi, which is also the name, Thoth Moses, Thoth Tuhudi, of the royal line of Egypt. So, and this becomes the Christ myth. Uh, Essene gold, righteous priest. You know, they said so that they they were using the gold making was the primary uh, cottage industry of the Essene culture. Um, and so then we're outlining here the Amun versus Atun is actually Enlil Amun, and Atun is Enki. And um, uh, like we said, uh, you know, why did uh, uh, Osiris have a green face? Enki, we're clear, was Osiris. And uh, I just be sure that remember we had that picture of, of the, the green the green face of Enki there. Uh, so um, Osiris, if he if Osiris doesn't go into the sun, the Nile doesn't flood on time. Any Egyptian could have told you that, as as we discussed in the last episode here. Uh, Tutankhamun wakes up with the ability to make rain because every pharaoh knows that you get fired as pharaoh if you can't make the Nile flood on time. And Tutankhamun, the rainmaker, relates to my experience with rainmaking, the triggering of Kundalini, which we now know is related to why Moses has horns because of the triggering of Kundalini. So, I wrote a book on the the, the memory of Anki, and you know, everybody has some memories of Anki because you know, <laughs> what goes around comes around. I mean, there's just one electron that just gets around. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's goldenmean.info slash Anki. Now, some have accused me of saying Enki was the good guy, and some have accused me of saying Enlil was the bad guy. Well, it, that's too simple. Um, but the agenda of Enki was clear, Atun, uh, Tom, as in uh, Andrew Poharts and Nine, Tom is also Atun, Tom, Enki. Um, Enki's agenda, uh, and remember, he was a trickster, trickster. He did fell in love with, fall in love with his cloning operations, that's true. Uh, and that, and he was something of a hero for humans, whereas Enlil uh, 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 was famous for hating humans. You know, he, he thought they were good for slaves to snack food. Whereas Anki thought the human cloning experiment was going to do something magical. So we called him later uh, Ra, and that's where we get the word Abram, Abraham. The line of Abraham is basically Anki's genetic experiment. That's where it starts. So remember E.T. origins? Now we've got the line of David, the line of Abraham. We see the E.T. root. So, now remember, as we mentioned, that Swaru, the Pleiadian, says Lemuria is the good guys, that's Pleiadian, and Atlantis is the bad guys, because that's reptilian Anki. So, well, a bit too simplistic here. Yes, uh, the Kingu reptilians were running from the Pleiadian female dominated. However, it's too easy to say one is the good guys and one's the bad guys. Because remember, we said the Pleiadians have agendas too. We know that the Marciniacs Pleiadians in included, encouraged, proper. Hello, genetic agendas for humans. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> okay. N next. Um, in our vignette outline here is the agenda of Enlil. So now, we, I, to finish the agenda of Enki, that 
One of Enki's best genetic experiments, later named Enoch, was taken back to Draco headquarters to be inspected for his genetics, as in the keys of Enoch. And um, so we now know who Enoch was. He was Gen Enki's best at the, in the day. It was the pride of his genetic uh, laboratory. And, um, uh, and now we know that in the present day, that lineage of Enki, one of their agendas is to use some of the more psychokinetic humanoids to take them back in the wars in Orion. So again, everybody seems to have an agenda for humans. Hello! So if we as humans don't sort out where we fit in all these agendas, hint, hint, the hero is the one who gets plasma projective lucid dreams, takes memory through death, implodes Aurora, and inhabits a star. Otherwise, <laughs> it's going to get messy. <laughs> so, so the agenda of Enlil, remember, Enlil called himself the Yahweh. Now, locally, worshiping Yahweh as Enlil is kind of dumb. Because <laughs> we agree with Anne Rice, who says, <clears throat> E-N-K-I-L, <laughs> is the largest vampire, I mean plasma parasite, in the solar system, sometimes named the Grim Reaper, who sucks up the souls after death. Oh, that's not somebody you should worship, probably. <laughs> and remember, Enkil's blood crystallizes and he becomes frozen there. <laughs> it's, it's a very long way. The plot thickens, as it were. This is Anne Rice. Anne Rice actually got some things right in the vampire history. It's the origin of plasma parasites. All that's basically at goldenmean.info slash Yahweh. But now the other side of that coin is, remember, for the Draco, uh, there was, they worshipped the Alpha Draco as their gods, actually. And the Alpha Draco, we know, are these huge, they weigh many tons, and they're extremely powerful, and they actually began to respect the galactic law that said you should respect indigenous peoples like these dumb humans and ended up actually helping the Pleiadians shoot out the reptilian Kingu inside the earth who eat humans, taking the inside the earth population of Kingu down from millions to a couple hundred thousand. And that's been, re that's, that's been documented from multiple sources. This is not a story. This is including military sources. So the Alpha Draco, these high, um, actually, uh, evolved and they became respectful and this is reported from many sources but for the draco the alpha draco are kind of quote, like quote unquote god and this is a bit of a background here because we know like in the relationship with the seraphim cut by five the Ophanian, the bird tribe the the wing makers that the ones that get big auras and become plasma projective Ophanim, the whirling ones, that's God. <laughs> so big auras are God and little auras are parasites. <laughs> it's pretty simple, isn't it? Well, so for Yahweh taking, I mean, sir, and Lil taking the name Yahweh, that's called being a wannabe. <laughs> I want to be. <laughs> and Yahweh is, the, look at golden mean, that is less Orion. You'll see the big plasma vortex shape of the star system of Orion is two great big vortex, Yod, He, Va, He, Yahweh, Yod, He, Va, He, Yod, Yod, goes that way, Va, Va, the vortex goes the other way. So I got two vortex going in opposite direction called Yahweh, Yod, He, Va, He, and if you inhabit those two light cones, then you can be a Yahweh. So what did Thoth mean when he said to the humans, you need no longer be spawn of the Nephilim. You know, all the statuary at the four corners that shows these reptilians eating the auras of humans. So enforcing the United Fe Federation of Planets rules against soul harvesting, uh, UFOP. Uh, this is a big part of the Andromedan local story when they kept these like the Rigelians taking these whole starships of humanoid souls off to eat them and make slaves. Well, there's laws against that. And once humans understand their role in this, then we can stand up for ourselves. So when you have bliss, your internal centripetal tornado gives you star inhabiting potential, the end of parasitism. That's the story to the more of this section. <laughs> Next little vignette, the history of Lucifer's eye, the Kaaba. Remember that you know, Lucifer says, 
you too can be God. So, and Lil says, well, you're the bad guy. If you tell these humans they can be God, that makes you the bad guy. <laughs> so, you know, yes, Lucifer lost the public relations war because he didn't have the checkbook. But that doesn't mean Lucifer's necessarily the bad guy. Now, don't go out there telling people, well, that I'm the devil. <laughs> Devil is only a name for live spelled backwards. What does that tell you? If you embed ability, that's L into the I of I to live. The opposite of embed ability is failure to embed, which is the physics of evil, and that's called the devil, which is the mirror image of live. So it's all done with mirrors. But anyway, Lucifer's eye was called the Kaaba. Now, the, the Kaaba, uh, remember we had one minute physics of alchemy, where, remember, if a glass meteorite, there's several types, but the glass meteorites particularly, uh, approaches the earth, the heat of re-entry will burn out every other metal except the platinum group metals, gold, palladium, and platinum. And if the gold vapor propagates uh, with the correct electrical symmetry through the glass, when it crystallizes, then the self-similarity of the gold vapor nanobubbles in the glass foam enables the charge implosion between the macromolecular monoatomic gold vapor in the sponge-like gold symmetry of the glass, meaning you have a super high dielectric constant, meaning you have an enabler of charge implosion. The physics of the Philosopher's Stone, measurable in super high dielectric constant. The self-similarity of the electron shell infinite unpacking uh, planes of Sharon of the monoatomic gold, self-similar to the foam geometry of the nanobubble content of the gold vapor in in the Sandwich foam geometry of molten glass, the glass meteorite, Lucifer's eye, which became the Kaaba stone. Now later, as Vincent Bridges, who we think incarnated probably not just as Kelly with John Dee, but also as um, uh, Philosopher's Stone uh, in Spain. And um, he said that the mad caliph historically documented allowed the grinding up of more than half the volume of the Kaaba stone and that reddish powder, you know that the gold powder philosopher's stone, projective powder used by John Dee and Kelly to make the purest gold that ever been measured by the British Royal Society in the alchemy that Dee and Kelly did with Rudolph. Uh, that red powder, projective powder it was called, uh, had this super high dielectric constant. Now if you take uh, about the size of a grain of rice of that embedded in wax was a wetting agent and drop that into the molten mercury which was atomic number remember is one below is the same as gold uh, the non-destructive charge collapse the only defined physics of alchemy implosive charge compression enabling more perfected recursion conjugate symmetry which is the definition of noble metals and gases um, in, in, and then he, he, uh, the, the mercury uh, will become gold. And um, we believe that Vincent was convinced that most of the gold they found in Egypt was actually alchemically made, for example. And remember that, that the science of alchemy then becomes an emotional technology because indeed that's what needs to happen in the heart when the pu seed of pure implosive symmetry enables the charge density, because remember at the center of all spin, only the shareable wave survives the definition of pure intention, which is the real spin density of alchemy, self-awareness. Next little piece here, that this is a picture of uh, from George in Ancient Aliens, it's, it's, it's the Zohar, the Ancient of Days, mistranslation of the transportable one with the tanks, uh, the mana machine, and so, um, the mono machine, we think, was a, a way of make, uh, making gold powder called showbread, which is the origin of Holy Communion. Remember, Holy Communion, remember, was served in a round white wafer, which was gold powder. And um, later it was showed at, at Rennes Chateau, was gold powder white was served in a pine cone shape. And so there's a, the red line and green line physics of feeding the... Uh, symbiotic algae microbes which make the monoatomic gold edible showbread uh, mana from heaven there was a sulfur 
was taken off it with the temperature was correct and this became edible gold now edible gold is real it's talked about all over uh, china and this is a real story and so the ark of the covenant one of its functions was to make the phase conjugate dialect implosive capacitance that would make the gold electrically stable in the monoatomic state hence the monobath from heaven the gold powder making and this was the core technology the cottage industry the the bread and butter money maker of the Essenes, Akka, Akhenaten, and Moses. Now, next little vignette we need to deal with is um, Gabriel is explicitly the author, the narrator, the, the angel that comes down to tell Mary in the Christian. Gabriel is the angel that comes down to tell uh, Muhammad. Uh, and Gabriel is the angel that comes down to tell Joseph Smith and the Mormon. So what was Gabriel's agenda? If we, if we want to know the origin of the next, uh, the or ET origins of earth religions, I guess we're going to have to know what Gabriel was up to, don't you think? So uh, remember what the Copper Scrolls were, both Essene and Mormon. The, now you have the genetic context here, the Draco culture with a high radioactive environment. Remember, radioactivity, as in Paul Brown's nuclear battery, is an electron transport expediter. It works great for making a nuclear battery, low-level radioactivity, because it makes electron transport. So low-level radioactivity has certain bliss, well, quasi-peak perception engendering qualities if you're a Draco from a home star with oil, blood, silicon nerves, a little bit of radioactivity is highly exponentiating for your metabolism. The downside of that was it meant faster genetic decay, faster, more genetic errors in genetic replication. And so uh, from the Draco perspective, DNA that changes is by definition defective. Now this is important to know because this is the origin of the caste system in India and uh, Aboriginal law in Australia. Remember why uh, the female and male languages were separate. So um, in order to prevent genetic mutation, you need to keep very careful genetic records to find out where Muabdi Kwasach was going to emerge from the bloodline psychokinetically and to keep a record of, to prevent genetic mutation, you had to record DNA records on copper scrolls. And this is the extraterrestrial orgi origin of Mormonism and modern day saints. Remember, the Urim and Thummim are basically a transparent tetrahedron that index the phase angle, the toroidal magnetic domain called Hebrew and ancient uh, Egyptian. And we're going to show that language chart in a minute. So the, if you look through the Urim and Thummim in the transparent tetra, you will index the phase angle of the input uh, toroidal magnetic domain called the letters of the alphabet. You know, my work on that half a lifetime ago, golden mean dot info set DNA ring, the shadows of a spiral on a torus indexed by the spins image of the tetra is called Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet. See, it physics, the origin Hebrew. And it's how you index magnetic donuts inside your head by visualizing them one at a time to vector navigate if you're lucid dreaming and traveling after death, because that implosion is how you steer. So the Drax were keeping track of their genetic records on Copper Scroll. So there's Gabriel. He's at the door. He's saying, eh, there's our genetic records. So Gabriel is high Draco. Now that's important to know because that gives you more context for what Gabriel is doing behind the origin of each religion on earth. Remember, every single one of them is afraid of women. <laughs> Little clue there. So uh, the, the high Draco, the Ophanum, uh, 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 are using this alphabet on the right. This is the Enochian tablets which we now know these were used to make the movie Stargate because you focus the plasma domains to implosive hypercube, which is what the symmetry of Lofana Minokian is, which remember, Cherokee Shaman Dahani Wahoo, our friend, and when I was teaching the Cherokee community, thanks to Dahani, and I showed the Ophana Minokian letters to Dahani Wahoo, she says, that's the star origin of the alphabet of our ancient star elders, the Adawi. <laughs> the Adawi, the ancestors of the, of the Cherokee, is Ophana Minokian bird tribe, whirling ones, uh, wing maker. 
and the other side of that same table, if you index those domain sequences, you get the name of the angels. Zav Kiel, here they are, Zad Kiel, Kunael, Raphael, Haniel, uh, Mikael, and Gabriel. So a symmetry sequence of these alphabet letters, plasma domains, in sequence make a name. Their name and their shape and their service are one to a plasma implode. So the concept of Ophanum versus Stargates, remember Ophanum alphabet was used to make the movie Stargate, that's the symbols of plasma hypercube implosion, and the high ancestors of these, the Siakon, the Archon, the Archon saw <laughs> Bill Clinton, <laughs> who was a wing, wing maker, uh, and the Archon is basically a high winged dragon. So now you're saying the dragon's good or evil, well, they're Uru, and Uru, remember, means ancient dragon blood. And remember our, our chart here, now I have that uh, preview chart, yes, okay, the chart here. The language of Uru, uh, here, I'm just going to take a, a one-minute pause here. Here, I'm back. <laughs> Too much tea for breakfast. <laughs> so the term Uru, we said, means ancient dragon blood, but notice the origin of An Agur, Hungary, Bulgaria, An Agur, Ural, Urup, Ibi Uru, Nibiru, Uru Asakaan, Etruscan, Roman Uru An. So the word Uru, ancient dragon blood, we're now getting the context to know what we mean by Ur, the ancient one. We talked about um, in the in the chemistry of the drac blood, uh, well documented. You had a white drac and a red drac. The red became Rothschild, the red shield, the red drac, and the white white became Caucasian. And we now know that's the red and white phosphorus, which is the electron transport me mechanism in the lipid oil drac blood. And remember even that the white dragon, uh, Caucasian root blood, originally was considered unclonable, and Enki was shocked when his mother snuck some of the white drag, Caucasian blood, into his cloning cooking pot, and Enki got the first fertile Takadama humanoid female, and which was fertile. He got the first fertile female by cloning the white Draco blood. The, the, the chemistry of cloning was a very advanced science in those days, which is why Anki's other name, Nudimud, means the cloner. But remember, after too many generations of cloning, you lose a soul. And we're defining here the physics of what it is to have a soul. Uh, Hank, hence, this is a clue to the Draco problem. The fallen ones, it meant more than they fell from heaven, it meant they lost their soul, which the symptoms of that disease were inability to take memory through death, inability to have bliss, inability to have lucid dream, and loss of long-term memory. All these symptoms of the disease called Draco Uru. Remember, there's many branches of the Draco Uras, which is the Uras bloodline, as Enki describes, but the central genetic issues about 
how can we use blood to make a soul? This is Humpty Dumpty's problem. This is a Draco problem. And this is a key behind how and why the Draco had agendas for humans. Namely, could we be made into the vaccine for Orion Wars? <laughs> Are we having an argument about vaccines here? Oh, no, no, no. You, you don't need to ban me, Facebook. I'm not saying all vaccines are bad. I'm merely saying... <laughs> I am merely saying that you know, if, if a local vaccine is a problem now, imagine what a problem it was for them who were trying to make a vaccine for the Orion Wars. Remember that myth was 22 extraterrestrial species, now we know it's many more, were involved in cooking up the human bloodline, Humpty Dumpty's egg, and uh, they were trying to make us, because there was a representative of all the pain in the vaccine. Oh, does that sound familiar? <laughs> and... Uh, and then humanoids could be a vaccine for the Orion Wars. Well, uh, you're getting the flavor here that if we could create a species that contains, embed, implodes the memory intent of all the different genetic diversity that led to the creation of humans, we could be a vaccine for the Orion Wars because we could be the recipe to restore fusion in the blood. Oh, oh, fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. <laughs> okay. So we talked about the night, the lipid oil drac uh, breathes out nitrogen, the dragon breathes poison, which became called the Plague of Azoth. And you remember that the Plague of Azoth was a name for the radiation poisoning caused by the Ark of the Covenant, Azoth also being the word for nitrogen. So it's a relationship there because the, the people who brought the radioactivity were nitrogen breathers, the, the Draco, okay? And for them, oxygen and moisture is effectively a poison. So they like deserts, low oxygen, and high radioactivity. Does that sound familiar? Who do you think is winning on Earth right now and why? <laughs> okay, now let's see. Alpha to gamma cascade is the known trigger to see without the eyes. You see, fractal... Uh, flameandmind.com slash outer vision, how we teach kids to see without their eyes. We said that the higher EEG frequencies of the Draco meant more telepathy, but le not less possibility for low frequency presence, which means you can't inhabit a long wave, which means you can't feel bigger things, which means loss of empathy for longer waves, like the feelings of planets. And so, whereas, so, you get a cascade of octaves in EEG. We now know this is a telepathy trigger, and Dracos are very good at that. But a golden ratio cascade extending from low all the way to high, Dracos can't do, and that's the empathy bliss trigger. So that's the difference recognizable in EEG power spectra, flameandmind.com. We spent a lifetime on that. So that's going to eventually lead us to have a, dis a discrimination about the difference between out-of-body experience, remote viewing, and lucid dreaming. They're all plasma projection into longitudinal EMF coherence. That's clear. So in each case, placement on the longitudinal array of earth grade magnetic bonds will, uh, will encourage, will enable out-of-body experience, remote viewing, lucid dreaming, because they'll enable you to plasma project the longitudinal array inhabit the fractal field, inhabit the field. Uh, we, we talked about um, uh, shamanism, shem on, I will raise a shem, I will raise a plasma projector, a jed, unto the Lord, uh, that in Castaneda's tensegrity, the shaman reaches down and pulls his aura from the earth ground like it's a carrot, and plasma projects. So Shem An is literally one who can plasma project lucid dream their aura. By definition, remember Shem means to inhabit the black hole, as in Shem stone, and Shem, C-H-E-M, the original term for Egypt, the land of the blue-black blood, the black pharaohs, or Enki, dark, dark blood. So the, the Draco were forced to have a caste system because they... Genetic diversity was an anathema to them. This is fundamental to the problem on Earth today, that once we understand the Draco believed that DNA that changes is defective, which is the opposite of believing in genetic diversity. Uh, and and uh, so 
So obviously, you could say, well, that means the Draco run. <laughs> The, the, the Draco run the monocultures of Earth. You know, the Draco are preventing genetic diversity. Well, it's a, it's a question of belief. They believe that genetic diversity was bad. Do you see the problem here? Where we get into the, the essential issue. And this became the caste system in India and the marriage law in Australia. And this also became why uh, the language of the male tribe versus the language of the female tribe was separate in Aboriginal. Remember the curse between the men shaman and the women shaman in Australia is the origin of the drought in Australia. A big part of that origin as proven by um, Malcolm Borgward, a partner with Richard uh, there at spiritsafaris.com. When Malcolm from Perth took that ritual to heal the ancient anger between men and women in rites across Australia, huge rainstorms accompanied those rituals because permission to touch for water vapor is called making a droplet, the physics of precipitation, and they were precipitating something by healing the ancient war between the sexes, literally. And now we're looking at the graph from Anton Parks of the name of the origin of the female versus male religion, the male language. So um, the emesa was the language matrix of uh, the priestess, of the female, the amasutum, and emesa became the language of the Babylonians, and then the root of Akkadim, the society of Akaldan, Chaldean. And that, uh, I emphasize here, um, is the language that Joseph Smith of the Mormons was documented to be studying just before he said he could interpret what was written on the Copper Scrolls. He was studying the Akkadim. The Akkadim, Akkadian, is the pre-Egyptian language Joseph Smith studied in order to interpret the, we now know, plasma domain residues on the Copper Scrolls. And now we know the ET context of the origin of the root of the female priestess line of the, the Mormon genetic records in that Draco culture, uh, uh, female dominated, uh, was, well actually I won't say, the Pleiadian culture was female, the Draco culture, the female side of the Draco culture, which had a different language for the male culture, became a, a cottage. So uh, Anton Parks does a, a great job in sorting between the Proto-Sumerian roots of the male language you see on the right is Emesa. Emes. You have Emesa versus Emenita. Emenita, Emengir, became the male language, which was the ancient Sumerian. And so ancient Sumerian is the male priests. And ancient Chaldean is the female priest language. And the reason you needed a separate language for male and female is a great root of the war of the sexes, you see. And uh, that's uh, an important part of why we need to understand the extraterrestrial origin of uh, religion on this planet. Uh, so then, this is what we're talking about, making rain in Australia, war of the sexes. The origin of fear of women behind almost every religion on the planet uh, lies in part on the female-dominated uh, religion of the Palladian. Uh, uh, and uh, in the Draco context, you have the female queens called Mag, as in Magda, Magdalene, Matrix of Agni, Matrix of Fire, Migdal, uh, to tower, the amygdala, uh, where the plasma towers and the snake stands on its tail, and from the amygdala, root of the reptilian brain, comes the Sanchidan, the Kundalini juice, uh, into the high brain, so the bird brain uh, eats the juice of the snake brain, and that's called Kundalini, the subject of the next film in this series. So, what ETs harvest now is genetic vaccine for the Orion Wars, ensoulment versus lucid dreaming, songline manipulation. Remember, in the Aboriginal lore, uh, the, the, when the baby first leapt in the womb, moved, the mother would make a magnetic map of the song lines of where the baby first jumped in the womb, and that would become the title deed over which land that child was responsible to lucid dream, holding that land together. Uh, we were supposed to talk about the solar shaman, why the sun's heart is cool and inviting, and uh, next time we're going to talk about Okta Yoga, 
star inhabiting, and the practical kundalini science for this bliss soul-making physics. So, to be continued.